This week on CrossFeed, a holiday to remember Jesus in late December. Russia sticks its nose in the church's business. A funeral becomes a political battleground. The sword of the spirit? How about the machete? And Bibles banned from airlines. Objection! So, it is uh, good to have everybody back, and uh, in the year 2007, this is CrossFeedNews.com. I'm Pastor Jim Butler, out in Dedham, Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Welcome, everyone, after a long hiatus, and we apologize for that uh, that hiatus. It was unintended. We were uh, ready to go several times, and uh, things just happen. Life happens. Um Things got crazy, and we had some crises that we had to deal with, and so I uh, apologize for being away so long, but uh, happy to be back, and uh, thanks for sticking around and waiting us out. So, Jim, did you have a good Christmas? I had a wonderful time, I think. Uh, my two oldest children are out, and that's always good to see them. And uh, so just had a really good time with all my kids and everything. So it was, it was good. But, you know, I really miss my kids being small. <laughs> you know? I, yeah, we still have that. I really do. I miss them being, you know, 8, 9, 10. You know, I mean, now, you know, they're 16. And it's, it's still there, but it's, it's different. Yeah. But I yeah, got the yeah. Superman Ultimate DVD collection, so it's really cool. <laughs> well, uh, I got Guitar Hero 2 for the PlayStation 2. And I've only had a chance to play it once so mm-hmm. far. You think that being on vacation this week could have some time, but no. <laughs> so, and I got this fancy schmancy headset. That looks really cool. <laughs> My daughter told me that I look like a um uh airline pilot except for the t shirt and jeans. <laughs> I was thinking more a telemarketer. <laughs> Great. Thanks. <laughs> Don't be too proud of this technological terror. Oh boy. That'll make you feel humble. <laughs> Speaking of airline pilot, let's talk about a stewardess. Who's mad because she can't carry her Bible on the plane with her? Uh, we have a stewardess uh, from England and uh, British Airways. She uh, she want, she takes trips on the plane to Saudi Arabia. Well, they've got some rules. See, she's a Christian, and she likes to carry her Bible with her wherever she goes. It's a great idea, but. Saudi law says that you can't bring a religious book into the country unless it's the Quran. And I have to wonder whether they allow English Qurans or not. Because technically, according to um, Islam, it's not really the Quran unless it's in Arabic. So, anyway. Um, yeah, they're not allowed to bring in narcotics, alcohol, pork products, and religious books apart from the Quran. And so she says, well, hey, wait a minute. You know, this is my personal belongings, and I'd like to be able to carry with me. I'd like to have my Bible. And <laughs> frankly, if I was going into a country like that, um, <laughs> I might want to have a little uh, comfort and reassurance with me, too. At the same time, eh, it could be a little dangerous. Yeah, I would think it's going to be a, be a little bit iffy there. Um, there's a pastor down in Missouri. I don't know if he uh, gets into us or not. Uh, by the name of Jim Meyer, and he was my roommate back in high school. And Jim's father was an American pilot who flew for Saudi Amer- Saudi Arabian Airlines. Fly casual. And hmm. um, he often said that was one of the problems they had was you know trying to worship in Saudi Arabia. You just couldn't do it. And uh, they were, uh, you know, it's, it's and I remember he told me um, he was going to Israel over for uh, one Christmas break. 
uh, for a class that we were having there. And he had to fly from Saudi Arabia to London or Saudi Arabian Airlines and take a British plane from England to Israel because Saudi Arabia wouldn't fly to Israel. <laughs> so, Of course. <laughs> what that has to do with this, I'm still not sure. But, you know, it's a nice little aside. Um, <laughs> you know, I understand her feelings. But, you know, this, these people are a little crazy. And I don't know if I'd want to take the chance of offending them. And, you know, I mean, and the airline said, well, you can do short haul flights. You know, you, you, you'll still get your hours in. Uh, we won't dock you for this or anything. But, it, you know, we're just doing what, you know, the British government told us to do, which is not allow you to take it in there. Yeah. I mean, I, it seems to me them trying to make a reasonable accommodation for her. Yeah, you know, there are other ways if she really wants a Bible with her. Um, she could, for instance, get it MP3 format. You can get the Bible free um, in MP3 format um, as like an audiobook kind of thing mm -hmm. from audiotreasure.com. And I'll, I'll plug them. They're not a sponsor or anything like that. Um, but it's it's free download. You know, she could take an iPod with her and stick that um, on her iPod and be able to listen to it, you know, while she's during layovers or whatever. And I don't imagine that that would be a problem. You know, it's not real obvious what she's listening to. You know, and there's, she could have, if she has a, um, like a, a palm or a pocket PC or something like that, she could have it loaded onto there. And there's lots of free Bibles that you can get as eBooks um, that you can put on there that she could have to read. It sounds like she's trying to make a statement. And I'm sympathetic, but at the same time, you know, part of this is just uh, British-Saudi relations trying to retain, you know, peace between the two of them and a little bit of give and take. So, yeah, I think, you know, if, if, if she wants to have a Bible with her, there are other ways to do it um, that aren't going to raise eyebrows and um, triggers. And... uh but if, you know, if she's trying to make a political statement, well, that's something else entirely. You know, I mean, it, it, the gospel is offensive. You know, Paul talks about that. And you and I, you know, you know, in our, in our, have talked about this before. But we don't want it to be unnecessarily offensive. I mean, why... Yeah. Why go out of your way to cause an issue here? They're trying their best that, that you know, poor airlines caught. And it's doing its best to try to accommodate her. Right. You know, why not just be gentle and just kind of go into the night and not get all upset about it? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I imagine part of this is she wants to carry it as a witness to her faith. But, you know, there's other ways to witness as well. And, and probably ways that, you know, just by, um, by being, uh, gentle as a lamb. Um, you know, that may even be a, a stronger witness to her faith um, than carrying a Bible. Yep. I was interested today, speaking of being a witness, I was talking to a young woman who graduated from, from Concordia, Missouri, who I found out is up here in this area working for a uh, a company. And um, so because we were alumni of the same school, she, she contacted me. And we were talking, uh, and she said, yeah, everybody at the, her company, you know, she's kind of the, the, the lone Lutheran there. And uh, they she said they often have uh, a lot of um, LCMS and ELCA churches buying coffee from them. And uh, they're also kind of a social justice organization. And um, so, you know, she was talking about, you know, the way she witnesses into her faith there. And they talk about, you know, her being the, the lone Lutheran. And this group is now getting hooked up with uh, Lutheran World Relief. Huh. So, uh, so she's going to be traveling to Nicaragua with uh, Lutheran World Relief next month. So, uh, hmm. I'm trying to see if I can't get her to start attending St. Luke's. But oh well, uh, I think we've kind of beat this story into the ground here. Speaking of carrying things, you're not supposed to be carrying. Oh yeah. Right, right <laughs> Man who brought machete to Fort Worth Church faces charges. 
All right, so picture this, all right? It's a Christmas Eve service, and the guy goes up to um, to the altar to pray. Well, he can't kneel down in front of the altar because there's a handmade machete in his pants. So, okay, just take that out and just set it on the altar while he's praying. <laughs> so he <laughs> places the machete and <laughs> gets up, prays, and, uh, <laughs> well, this sort of raises a bit of um, uh, concern um, <laughs> from the other uh, people that are there. And <laughs> so they uh, they call the police. <laughs> and uh, so he didn't try to use it or anything. He just, you know, he, he couldn't kneel with it in his pants. And I uh, said he also, uh, when the police stopped him, they found a dagger and uh, a, crudely, a crudely made firearm called a zip gun, which if you want to know what that is, I'm sure you can look it up on Wikipedia. So it said the machete had been sharpened on one side and its handle was a tree limb wrapped in black tape and a leather belt. So handmade machete. <laughs> you ever had people bring weapons to church, Jim? This is madness. My last church, I walked in one morning and there was a bullet hole through one of the windows. <laughs> Did they think you were there? <laughs> we think they were having some kind of shooting there in the neighborhood and uh, we came in and there was a bullet hole and there was a bullet sitting laying in the middle of the, all- middle, middle of the carpet. That was a little scary. But no, we never had anybody actually bring a weapon into the church before. Wars not make one great! Unless, of course, you count my oldest huh. son, who always happened to have a knife with him, and no matter what, what he did. Well, I'm assuming he doesn't carry it as a weapon no more, as a utility sort of thing. Uh, no. Uh, he, he ever caught a school with those things in your pocket they considered a weapon, so... <laughs> yeah. Well, just about anything is nowadays. That's true. But man, what a scare! That, that, I mean, that, 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 I don't know what I would do. This guy all of a sudden brings a fifteen-inch machete knife out of his pocket. Um, You're crazy. I remember this so, uh, guy in my first church. We had a school. This one third grader's father. He comes into parent-teacher conference, and he had a uh, like ten-inch stiletto knife in his back pocket. <laughs> Hey, man, this don't feel right. <laughs> Be careful what you say to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. they're like, Pastor, would you mind being around during this conference? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> My donkey senses are tingling all over. You see what kind of things you miss being out there in Iowa? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just, you know, we don't get that. It's just farmers and, you know, factory workers. and I mean, you know. I suppose we've got our share of nuts, but um, <laughs> those are politicians. The news like that. <laughs> That's all the presidential oh. candidates. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but this is a religious podcast, not a political one, <laughs> so we're just not going to talk about that. <laughs> so. Uh. No, I just don't Speaking know of politics... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, good, go ahead. Move on. All right. Uh, man in right to die case mourned outside of church. All right. This, he's a Roman Catholic, and he uh, worked with his doctor or, or talked to his doctor. He was, he was paralyzed and had the doctor disconnect his respirator, and so he died. Well... The church, or the, presumably the priest, said, well, we can't have the funeral in the church because essentially it's a suicide. And he was conscious and he made a decision to have his respirator disconnected. And um, so they, um, at his funeral, there were people uh, holding up signs um, that said, church, shame on you. And uh, this was in Rome, by the way. And they, uh, the whole thing's just sort of turned into a, um, a political rally for uh, the right to die um, lobby. Well, no, so he was. Uh, As I said, he could not eat, 
speak or breathe on his own. But yet it, it was removed at the patient's request. So I'm not sure if you can't eat, speak, or breathe on your own, how you can make a request. You could, you know, write it on paper. You know, I mean, but... Or, or you know, point to the, the plug and, you know. But generally, I mean, when you're on a respirator, you're really rarely in any condition to point to anything. I mean, I've been True. in enough hospitals in 20-some years of ministry with people on respirators. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, you've only got something shoved down your throat. And, uh, yeah. I mean, um, so I'm just not sure. You know, I, I was wondering if he had told them before. You know, but I, you know, if I come to this point, I mean, because I, I, I kind of came on the opposite side of the of of, of the church in this case. I, I was kind of on the side of the protesters. I mean, if you you can't eat on your own, you can't speak on your own, you can't breathe on your own. Then at what point then is are, is is the is the living being artificial? I mean, if I was of the family and this guy can't eat, speak, or breathe on his own. And they said, you know, we would like to allow him to die. I probably would say I think that's a good decision. Yeah, I, you know, maybe we need to know more about it. Um, it said, uh, the church said Friday it decided to deny a religious funeral for him because his will to end his life was known as it had been repeated and publicly affirmed in contrast to Catholic doctrine. So it really sounds, and I mean, this is from the Chicago Tribune, so we're not talking about a Catholic news service that's going to be, you know, supporting one side of it. It sounds like he, in some way, expressed a desire to um, to have it removed. Yeah. Now, the thing is, you know, that said, when people are in that I mean, it sounded like he was in a very difficult position. And while you know, on the one hand, yeah, it's wrong to to end human life if, assuming he was still you know conscious and and that. Um, but at the same time, by refusing him a religious funeral, you know, what kind of message is the church sending? And basically, to me, when I look at this, it sounds like the church is saying he committed an unforgivable sin. You know, in essence, they're saying he's in hell. Right. And and I wouldn't go there. I mean, you know, boy, people do all kinds of things that they might not do under, you know, ideal circumstances when they're in extreme pain and, you know, and just can't take it anymore. I mean... There have been times in my life where I have been in such an extreme state of suffering um, just because of like a, a drug reaction, uh, a drug allergy that made me so incredibly uncomfortable that I wanted to die. And I, you know, given the opportunity, I, you know, I don't know what I would have done. But I mean, they they got me taken care of and I was fine. But, you know, boy, if you're in a situation like that, where you're just in some kind of extreme discomfort, you know, yeah, it's wrong to end that life. And yet, at the same time, I can understand that decision. Okay, yeah, the decision's a sinful decision. Does that make it unforgivable? No, absolutely not. The, un the only unforgivable sin is rejecting Christ. But even there, it may not even be necessarily sinful. You know, <laughs> I mean, I'll never forget coming out of a, a, a nursing home one time and uh, meeting this woman, and she comes up and she says, Father, because, of course, we're up here and I had a collar on. And she says, it's okay if I pray for my husband to die. I said, well, why? And she's telling me that he had been a composer and a conductor of an orchestra and choral conductor and had Alzheimer's and all of it was gone. Just the whole thing. And I looked at her and I said, well, do you, are you praying 
for him to die because you're, he's a burden to you and you have to come down here and visit him and you're tired? I said, or do you want to be up, you know, conducting the choirs of heaven? She goes, I want him to conduct the angels and sing. I want him to be freed of the pain that he's in now. I said, in that case, let's pray that the Lord would take him. I mean, you know, for the Christian, you know, death is not the end. For us, it's the transportation to something really beautiful. And so this guy said, you know, this guy might have been saying, I want to die. I want to get to heaven already. I'm tired of the suffering of this world. Right. You know. I mean, otherwise, what do we do with Bach's beautiful cantata? Come, suser tote. Come, soothing death. Come, blessed repose. Come, close my eyelids gently. I'm tired of this world and weary. Come, soothing death. Come, blessed repose. I mean, that's a statement of faith. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I had a, um, there's a guy in my church. This, uh, uh, a few months ago, um, they just really just been through the ringer, um, heart problems and all kinds of things. And, um, and, and he, he, he says to me, yeah, it's horrible to get old. And, and I just sort of jokingly said, well, beats the alternative. And, uh, <clears throat> and he looked me straight in the eye and he said, no, it doesn't. I had a few of them tell me that too. Pastor, don't pay to get old. But you know, you know, he was saying, "No, I'd I'd rather be in heaven right now." Yep. Thank you very much. So, I, I remember <laughs> couldn't argue with him. <laughs> I've I've had more than a few of them. So yeah, I, tough call, but for the church to sort of hand down judgment like that. Uh, it, it just, to me, it seems like a missed opportunity to say, you know, instead of saying, no, he can't have um, a funeral here, imagine being able to, to do that funeral and to say, look at the grace of God. Look that, that he was with him, that, you know, that God cares for us, even in the midst of such great suffering. And that, you know, and even if they wanted to emphasize that this is a sin, that look at the grace of God, that he forgives all sins. Mm -hmm. But then, I mean, you know, there was a time with Lutheran churches, if you were a suicide, they wouldn't bury you. That was pointless. You know, I've heard that, and I just, I can't understand that. I, I can't either, but I'll tell you, I had a, a member of my last church, and uh, she was raised with Wisconsin Synod. This is not to be a slam at the wells. And uh, just the fact, and uh, her father committed suicide, and the pastor said, I won't bury him. And um, and uh, I know a few people like that, and it, 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 situations like that. Matter of fact, if you uh, look at the old agenda, it says, out of suicide, if it's in such cases that the pastor can bury him, or something like that. Hmm. But the idea was, if you didn't, they took their own life, and if you didn't hear them confess their sin, then you couldn't be sure of anything. You know, that that comes from the whole idea that really it's kind of based on the idea that, that faith is a uh, um is is based on our our reason and, and it's it's a decision kind of concept. That that oh well, you know, there was where was his faith there? And and yet but faith given that faith is a gift of God, the point is is that we are in a. The argument's always been that well, when you commit suicide, you don't have a chance to um, to repent of that sin. But that suggests that that it, the act of repentance is the work that saves you, and it's not. Repentance comes from faith, and it's faith that saves. And <clears throat> so, you know, it doesn't. The onus is not on us. That suggests that if at the moment of your death, if you would have a sinful thought, that, oh, you know, oh, you, you, uh, you know. I often say I'm driving down the road and I look up and all of a sudden there's a semi coming in my lane and my last thought is, oh. 
Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So what, you go to hell for that? You know, which if you're a Hare Krishna, that works. But, uh, you know, that's not our, that's not our faith. I, I have to think of things that kind of a, an umbrella of grace. You know, I mean, Luther says that, you know, we, we even, you know, when we say forgive our sins, we're even confessing those sins we don't even know we did. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, yeah. that, that umbrella, you know, I can see. I mean, I, I, I know Lutheran school principal who attempted suicide. I you know in some other situations. I can see even one of God's people being very caught in despair. And the people I've talked to who have attempted, you know, they said at that time it just didn't seem like there was any other way. There's nothing else they could do. But again, I'm not mm -hmm. sure in this case it was suicide. I, uh, um, you know, this one seems to me could be a very I've been in a, if you haven't had, been in the hospital room yet with the family making that decision, uh, the day will come and you will be. Um, and, uh, I've been there. Yeah. That was the first time I actually saw a family, um, I actually saw somebody die. Was, I was with a family when they removed the guy from, uh, the respirator and then I stood with the family as he passed. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened yep, with my mom, here. matter of fact. We made the decision to have her removed. Because uh, she wasn't good. It was over. We knew it. So we had her removed and, and let the Lord take her. Well, speaking of churches, rocks, and hard places, um, uh, in Russia, it's uh, the church's status and uh, situation is sort of tenuous. Don't really know what's going on. Now, this is a follow-up to a previous story, um, which, unfortunately, can't be accessed anymore unless you're a subscriber to the Russian Post or something like that. But, um, but we have the follow-up story at USA Today. And basically, we have the, the Russian government wants to stick their nose into churches and wants to require churches to give weekly information on how many members they have, how many people are, are visiting that week, the which people are um, were there that week, how much money they got from whom, um, you know, just really detailed information, kind of information that most churches don't even have that detail of information. You know, for instance, they want to know how much money was from uh, local and how much money was from tourists from outside the country. Well, when people throw coins into the offering plate, you don't know where them. I mean, unless it's American money or something, or you know, from some other country, you don't know where that money came from or who that money came from. You know, and to, what are you going to do? Say, sorry, um, we're not going to accept offerings unless it's in an envelope with your name and um, place of origin on it. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, a lot of people are really afraid that this is, it's getting back to that sort of big brother, um, you know, the way it was in the Soviet Union where um, you had to report all this stuff to the government. And now the Russian government is saying, well, um, you know, this was, the intention here was not so much um, churches, it's more sort of nonprofit organizations that receive support from um, from outside the country. And um, but you know where do you draw the line? They're saying that well, okay, if we're going to do this for nonprofit organizations, that includes churches, and if we're not going to include churches, then we're being inconsistent. And and then we're just picking on the secular nonprofit organizations. So, what are we going to do? So they're trying to tell the churches, oh well, you don't have to worry about it. But at the same time, the churches are saying, well, you know, what are you going to do here? Right. right. I, I'd be worried enough if, if this was in America. Um, and I'd be really, and I'd be sure about the stuff. But um, when we're talking about Russia and given its past history under the Soviet Union and what it did with churches then, 
it brings some very scary, questionable feelings. I mean, because, yeah. I mean, they, one guy said he went in to register his church, and they wanted the names and addresses of all the members of the church. That's a scary request. Yeah, and, and according to the law, he doesn't even have to give that information, but they asked for it anyway. Right. Well, what do you do when, when the government official says, you need to give me this information? Um, <laughs> and, you know, in America, you just go, hey, I'm an American, and you can't do this to me. But uh, <laughs> it's not like that in Russia. No, not necessarily, especially because, you know, I even talked about how uh, Vladimir Putin's government has been, you know, giving higher, more state control and less freedom. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a fear that they'll go back to this battle days of the Soviets. And we really don't want to see that happen. Uh, I mean, this is one of those areas where, um, you know, it seems to me that, that, that churches and really all faith organizations, whether you're Christian or not, need to stand together and say, you don't go here. Because this is one of those situations where one can be, if one is at risk, everybody can be at risk. You will unite or you yeah, will absolutely. fall. So April 15th is the deadline um, where churches are supposed to have the information in, but they're saying, well, we're not going to enforce it. So we'll see what happens. And so, you know, stay tuned. Uh, and uh, we'll make sure to to keep up on, on what's going on with that to find out. And if anybody else um, sees any stories or information about this, um, by all means, post it up at CrossFeed. Let us know. Yeah. Well, right now they said, you know, it probably won't be implied on churches. And uh, I, I really like the uh, Catholic Archbishop in Moscow says, we think it is wrong and even impossible to comply. Mm -hmm. Go get him, Archbishop. Well, yeah. yeah. I, when you put impossible requirements on people, you know, come on. So, I don't know. You know, in America, the Supreme Court would just shoot it down and say, you can't do that. You know, so I, the Russian government doesn't have the same kind of setup. So, we'll see how that goes. Yep. Well, last story. Life moves pretty fast. December 26th. Jesus Day. Uh? Now, is it me or doesn't he already have December 24th and 25th? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we have the, you know, the three festivals, three days there at um, Easter, you know, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday. Well, maybe the Nigerian Christians want to do the same thing here at Christmas, too. Um, technically, because now he has 24th and 25th, really he has, you know, 12 days here. And today, of course, is the 11th day of Christmas. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, that uh, December 26th, uh, often called for the Canadians and British out there, Boxing Day. Uh, now and there is to be called uh, Jesus Day. And, uh, and they held a rally uh, there in Nigeria as organized by World Rescue Missions in Ministries International. And um, the people all stood out there and said, you know, cry Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Um, Nigeria Sometimes. is our Jerusalem. Lagos is our Jerusalem. Let peace reign in Nigeria. Let the purpose of God for Nigeria prevail over any plan of man against our nation. And they shouted out, yeah, Jesus, 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 seven times. Expecto Patrona! Oh, now they also want to do the same thing at Easter. Yeah. Whatever happened to he is risen, he is risen indeed. <laughs> I like that one better. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess I, I looked at this and I thought, well, okay, you know, Christmas being somewhat lost um, as far as, uh, you know, sort of losing sight of what Christmas is all about and the whole keep Christ in Christmas and all that. And, you know, this I looked at this and said, okay, well, all right, we lost Christmas. We need a new day. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, we had a full church on Christmas Eve, so which 
you know, we had a whole lot more people there than we have on a Sunday. So, um, you know, people are still remembering that Christmas is all about Jesus. And, well, around here anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, we've had other stories about people that uh, in other countries and that where the, the the surveys say that, you know, people think it's Santa Claus's birthday and all kinds of stuff like that. But, you know, they... <laughs> This I looked at this, and it, it sounds like they're thinking, the, the gist that I got from it is, you know, if we put up billboards that say Jesus on them all over the place and, and have everybody talking, you know, put his name on your the back of your car with your fish emblem and, and, uh, and all this kind of stuff, you know, then the world will be a much better place. We'll have peace and, you know, and, and not have all the problems that we have today. And I'm thinking, well, that's a real nice theology of glory there. And um, completely unrealistic. You know, if anything, if you, you know, it's, it's kind of like you said, Jim, you know, what happened to he's risen, he's risen indeed. I mean, if you're going to, instead of just saying his name, in like some kind of incantation, you know, how about proclaiming the gospel? Not just saying Jesus, but Jesus loves you and he died to take away all your sins, you know. Um just saying his name over and over, unless somebody knows um, the Hebrew origins of the name, it's not going to do a whole lot of good. Right. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because we said, you know, um, yeah, make the name of Jesus more visible to check the ills of the nation. Trust in the problem of society is more spiritual than physical and can be effectively tackled spiritually through the name of Jesus. I mean, reading that paragraph and putting up these billboards and you got Jesus' name on your, 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 it almost sounds to me, it goes back to, um, that second commandment where Luther says not to use the name of Jesus, the uh, name of God superstitiously. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which the, LCMS for some reason translates it as, as satanic arts, which is probably one of the worst translations I ever came across. Uh, the idea is, you know, it was really, you know, people who would pray the Lord's Prayer over their pigs so they would have better sow, uh, you know, better litters. You know, it was this idea of using this stuff as, as, as a magic charm. And this kind of strikes me the same way. You know, if you put the name of Jesus out there, it's going to, you know, heal just by the very nature of, just because the name is there. And you do it You've got to get the inflection right. No. It's Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's about it. Oh, for for our, uh for those who are listening and not watching, um if you didn't see my magic wand. So. Right. You know, it, it strikes me as almost the same thing though. You know, that you know, this is, we're using this almost as a magic charm. Diagon Alley. Because Yeah. You know, just chanting the name Jesus apart from really the gospel. The one chooses the wizard. Well, and that's the other thing I noticed about this, is that the gospel was pretty much completely lacking here. It's all about, we want to make the world a better place. We want to, you know, improve morality and we want to, you know, improve the government and all this kind of stuff. Uh, there, there's nothing in here about, we want more people to know of Jesus' love so that they can uh, receive faith through hearing the gospel and go to heaven. Mm-hmm. No, nothing about that. So I, maybe that just wasn't mentioned in the news story. I, I hope that that's what the case was. But um, yeah, it's it's all about it's everything that I'm seeing here in this article is it's all about you know if we just get that name out there. Um, that that's going to improve morality. It's going to make the world a better place. It's you know it's all about the law, right? And that's not what the gospel's about, right? Even though they're right, even though they're right, it's really not a societal ill. It's a spiritual issue. It's still mm-hmm. not what the whole thing is. It's about. Although I mean, there is such a thing as you know works of mercy and human care done in the name of Jesus, and those are very important things to do. So, oh, absolutely. Uh, 
like they can always sometimes be a struggle too. Well, folks, that's about our show for this week. Maybe a little bit shorter, um, but uh, some some odd stories anyway. And hopefully a little bit there to think about and some of the uh, issues of pastoral ministry that pop up here and there as well. So, Dale, if they want to comment, how do they get a hold of us? You can call our voicemail at 206-202-0819 or... You can email us at crossfeed at gmail.com. And, or you can just go to crossfeednews.com and post your comments to the specific stories that we've um, discussed here. And uh, by all means, go and, and find other stories and uh, post links to the stories. Or if you have, you see something going on, you find out about something going on and you don't. There's no news story on the internet anywhere. Then go ahead and uh, click on news story and write your own story. And also want to let people know, um, for those who are not aware of it, that you can go to uh, if if you log in and uh, set up a free uh, user account if you haven't yet. Uh, you can go to your user profile and you can click on auto subscribe. And what that'll do is it will notify you anytime there's new new news stories posted at Crossfeed, you will get um, and I forget it's it's a couple times a day I think, uh, or maybe once a day, you'll get an email with the email address that you put in that will list all of the stories and it'll include the links in the stories and um, how that's so that if you it, but it'll have the 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 description that's listed there. And so that you can always know what the stories are. Um, so you don't, I mean, you don't even have to go to the website. Um, but the, it has the links to the stories on the website, and then you can click through that to get to the, the original story. Uh, but it'll also have all the blog posts and, and anything else that's, that's added. So you can always be on top of what's new. And um, so it's just an easy way to, to stay on top of what religious news stories are out there. And so, yeah, and, and in fact, uh, I believe now it's set up so that if you create a user account, you will automatically be subscribed. Now, if you don't want it, you can just, there's a little checkbox there, and you can say, no, I don't want to be subscribed to this. But, um, but yeah, it's, a, it's just an easy way to, to keep up with the, all the news stories. So, and, and it'll also list the comments there, too. So, pretty much all the new information. I um, want to send out a big thank you to our uh, sponsor, PDAPerformance.com. They create some really great uh, Palm software for Palm OS handheld devices. And so I encourage you to stop over their website and check them out if you haven't already. And um, also want to mention, if you haven't been over to the website, to CrossFeedNews.com, uh, we now have a CrossFeed News store where you can get... Uh, T-shirts, sweatshirts, uh, uh, just all kinds of stuff, mouse pads and, and that. Um, it's not a Cafe Press store. Uh, a lot of people use Cafe Press for uh, for these kind of things. Um, but Cafe Press, uh, in my experience and people that I've talked to that have used them, um, you you can get the you know nice shirts or whatever, but then you wash them a couple times and the stuff all washes off. Well, we use a different company. Um, for ours that uses just a better quality of transfer, uh, a little better quality shirts and that, um, and so they should be a lot more durable. And so you don't have to feel like you're throwing your money away. And um, and the the shirts say, they have the CrossFeed logo on them, and they say correspondent on them. And the idea is that every one of you, our listeners and viewers and people who visit the website, are all correspondents. Um, you know, when you go to another news site, you, the, the correspondence of the people that, that submit the news stories to those news sites. Well, at CrossFeed, everybody's a correspondent. Everybody submits the news. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a community and, and we all, anyone who is submitting news is, is part of it, is adding, um, to the, to the whole. And uh, so you can 
uh, get a, a cross seed correspondence shirt and wear it with pride, even you know, go out and, I don't know, conduct an interview and send it to us. We'd love that. That'd be cool. So. Now, I was looking um, but, for the cross feed correspondent coffee mug. You know, they don't have coffee mugs. This guy is a real zero. It's it's not available as an option. Uh, but there's I'm coasters. I'm going to buy a coffee mug with our logo on it. So I could sit here and drink it and people could see it as we did it. It was going to be a, a I was going to have it in my, as I taught Bible class to be a, you know, you know <laughs> uh, uh, a product placement ad. <laughs> That's what churches need. More product placement. <laughs> so, uh, anyway. You know, I should also mention, once in a while you see one of us drinking something while we're recording a podcast or something like that. PDA Performance is our only sponsor right now. And um and for ever ever since we began. We may pick up other sponsors in the future, but if anytime we have a sponsor, we will let you know. Um, if you see one of us drinking something or, or whatever, you see something in the background or something, that's not product placement. Uh, it's completely unintentional. And it, you know, it's just because we don't take the time to go through and put little labels or blur things out or whatever the way they do on, um, TV shows and stuff like that. So if we have a sponsor, we'll let you know. We're not going to be devious about that or anything. But if you so. want to give us 20 bucks for doing it, we won't say no. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we thank you all for listening to us again or watching us again this week. Pray that God would give you a joyous last couple days of Christmas and a joyous epiphany this Sunday. Uh, the Saturday. Concentrate, Pinky, concentrate. God's blessings to everyone. Good night, everybody. And good night. Good night.